Hello and welcome back to the Air Armoury. I'm JRH and today I'm looking at the CZ VZ47 Air Rifle. So this rifle is made by CZ, or to give them their full name, Cheska Zabrovka, which translates as Czech Arsenal or Czech Armoury. Um, and as many of you will be aware, CZ are still around, albeit now as a private company, and are still producing firearms and air guns in the Czech Republic. Uh, VZ is short for Zora, spelled VZOR, which is the Czech word for model, and the number relates to the year of introduction. So VZ47 basically translates as the model of 1947. I'm just going to interrupt myself very briefly here. Now I said that with great authority that VZ is short for Zora or model, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. It's possible that, that VZ stands for Zuvdohovka, which is the Czech word for air rifle, uh, but I believe it is um, short for Zora as other CZ guns that aren't air rifles still have that VZ and year designation. Now this gun was made between 1947 and 1950, with this particular gun being circa 1948. The first thing you notice about this gun is that it looks very military-esque, and that is because it is in fact a military air rifle. Uh, these were produced as training rifles for the Czechoslovakian army. So following the Second World War, uh, with limited resources and funds available, the army turned to air rifles for training purposes. And that was because an air rifle was cheaper and quicker to manufacture than their standard issue infantry rifle. So despite the fact that this is a genuine air gun, this is in fact a military issue training rifle. So let's take a closer look. The rifle is 108 centimetres or 42 and a half inches long with a 50 centimetre or 19.7 inch rifle barrel and it weighs 4 kilograms or 8.2 pounds so it really is a full size and weight gun. Now looking first at the construction of the gun, it's a really well made rifle which I guess it had to be to endure the rigours of military training. It has a military style 3 quarter length hardwood stock with an upper hand guard which is held on with a barrel band and this front cap. Uh, you can see here it has what looks like a cleaning rod at the front uh, but that is actually a fake cleaning rod and can't be removed. I assume that was added partly for an authentic look but also to act as a stacking swivel for soldiers to tent their rifles to stop them falling over or putting them on the ground like on the BSA logo with the three guns standing up together. Uh, sling swivels on the underneath of the barrel band and on the rear of the stock although I suspect this front barrel band is actually a homemade replacement especially compared to the rear one um, and it also has a nice sturdy steel butt plate the metal parts are all blued steel and it has a lot of very intricate well machined parts especially on the cocking mechanism which we'll come back to in a minute uh, it also has though some slightly cheaper stamped parts such as the hopper cover uh, barrel band and uh, front sight hood. Uh, this is presumably to keep costs down um, as it's been skimped on slightly compared to CZ's previous air rifle trainer, the VZ35, which had all machined parts and even had a bayonet lug on the front. Uh, that being said, though, it is a very well made gun with build quality still better than that of most good quality modern guns. I'm not going to take the whole rifle apart in this video, but I will take the stock off just to show you what it looks like underneath and now seems as good a time as any. Now as this is a military style stock it's slightly more complicated than your average sporting stock. So first of all I need to remove the screw from this front cap. I can then slide this up the gun over 
and loosen, but I don't need to completely remove the screw from the barrel band. Once that's sufficiently loose, maybe a little bit more. and then slide that barrel band up and over the end and with those off the hand guard can come off then on the underneath of the gun I need to remove two screws first of all this main one here And then one of these screws in the trigger guard. Uh, I think it's the rear one. I think the front one just holds the trigger guard on. I can't quite remember which is which. So I am just going to take them both out. Yeah, I think that's just the trigger guard one. all the screws are done, I can then manoeuvre the action out of the stock. As you can see it's slightly more recognisable as an air gun without the stock. Now I'm not going to take it apart any further, uh, mainly because there's no real need to, but also because I'm not 100% sure how to. Now I'm generally happy to disassemble spring guns, but with this one, when I needed some work done it, I was so scared that I would never get it back together again, I did actually take it to a gunsmith. I can, however, show you roughly what the internals look like, as I have some excellent technical drawings of the gun, including this very detailed one of the um, cocking mechanism. Now these are clearly much better diagrams than you get of most air guns. I presume they were done because it's a military gun, but they could even be patent drawings or something. Now I'm going to put the stock back on. Um, I'll talk about, about the markings later on in the video, uh, but just to point out there are no additional markings which are covered by the stock, uh, otherwise I'd show you those now. This is a spring piston air rifle and as you've probably already noticed it is bolt action with a large straight bolt handle at the back. Uh, unusually for an air rifle though this is a true bolt action in that the bolt handle is actually the cocking lever so to cock the gun you pull the bolt handle up and then pull it back until it cocks then push it forward again to close the bolt. Now because the bolt handle has a comparatively short travel it takes a fair bit of force to cock the gun and you do have to pull the bolt back quite hard. Now as I mentioned earlier the cocking mechanism is a good example of how well made this gun is. It's very solid with nice audible clicks at every stage of the action. Um, the bolt handle even has a small um, counter spring to stop heavy metal to metal contact when the handle goes forward. So to cock it it's actually locked there, you have to push it in against that counter spring in order to lock it down. <clears throat> uh, to insert the ammunition, you slide back this cover, which um, reveals a small gravity fed hopper. Um, so to load it, you drop your ammunition in, and then as the bolt handle is pulled back, um, the pallet drops down and then you close the bolt to fire it. Now this stamped sliding cover does keep the 
ammunition in, although it's not quite as well made as on the VZ35 that I mentioned earlier on, which did actually have a machined spring-loaded catch. Um, and this hopper takes around 20 pallets, so it is actually a repeater, which I'll demonstrate now. You may have noticed in that clip that it doesn't function flawlessly as a repeater as the hopper is just gravity fed so without any kind of spring or feed mechanism it is prone to both not feeding when the lead balls are all wedged against each other and double feeding if the ball in the breech rolls forward and allows another one to drop in behind it. Uh, but that's partly due to the ammunition I'm using which I'll come back to in just a second. Uh, that being said though it works okay most of the time and it really is good fun shooting it like that. So in terms of the ammunition that this rifle uses, as you saw a minute ago from when I loaded it, this takes lead balls as opposed to regular pellets. Uh, the VZ47 has a rifled barrel, uh, so the balls have to be lead, or at least coated lead, so you can't just use steel BBs or anything in it, as that will ruin the rifling. Now strangely the calibre isn't marked anywhere on the gun, but it's actually in a slightly unusual calibre. This rifle is in 4.46mm. Um, which is the only calibre it was made in, so it's just a fraction smaller than 177, which is of course 4.5mm. Now because of that, it isn't easy to get ammunition for it, in fact it's been a bit of a nightmare. Uh, I've only managed to find one company which makes 4.46mm lead balls, which is actually CZ themselves. I have here a tin of their number 10 round balls, which as you can see are marked as 4.46mm. Um, I haven't found anywhere in the UK that sells them, so I've had to get those shipped in from Germany. Now, so far so good, however they don't actually work very well. They aren't particularly well made, um, and they're not very uniform in terms of size or weight. And as uh, this isn't a massively powerful rifle, uh, the pellets generally struggle to get out the barrel a lot of the time. Um, most of them get stuck, so basically they're unusable. I've now measured a load of them though and found that they're actually well over 4.46 millimeters. I then tried a number of 4.4 millimeter lead balls with mixed results, but I've now settled on two types which are suitable. The first are these Checkmade CZ number no. nines, which are basically the 4.4 millimeter version of the number no. tens. And now they weigh an average of 8.08 grain. And the second ones are these German-made Grief Puntkelgelm. Um, there's slightly less English on that tin, um, but described as Luftgewehr Kugeln. Now, I know Luftgewehr is air gun. I think Kugeln uh, translates as something like ball or something similar. And those ones average at 7.65 grain. Now, the Grief ones are the better of the two in terms of quality. Uh, the CZ ones are cheaper and very slightly easier to get hold of, though. Uh, that being said, I still have to have both of these sent from abroad so I've started buying them in bulk to save on postage and to stockpile them so that I won't run out in case availability gets any worse. Uh, the only saving grace is that even with postage they aren't massively expensive uh, especially the CZ ones as they're only around four euros for a tin of 600. Uh, the grief ones are very slightly more than that though. The VZ47 has a single stage non-adjustable trigger which is to be expected from the nature of the rifle and the time period it was made. It has a relatively short but quite heavy trigger pull. Uh, it's not fantastic, but it is certainly usable. It has a manual safety, uh, which is a rotary safety catch at the back of the action just before the bolt handle. Uh, it's really nice, big and chunky. Nice audible clicks between the positions. It has a three position safety, although two of the positions seem to do the same thing. So it's pulled all the way to the left like this, so you can freely pull the trigger. When it's rotated into the up or 
upright positions uh, it locks the trigger and you can't fire that. And when you turn the safety round you can actually see the cutout which lines up with the trigger in the fire position and allows you to pull the trigger and it's purely a trigger safety uh, none of the positions lock the bolt or anything. Now the sights are very typical of military rifles at the time the rear sight is adjustable for elevation which is done by sliding this bar forward which raises the sight and that is graduated from 10 to 25 meters uh, that's not adjustable for windage though and the front sight is a standard hooded post and that post is held in with a dovetail so it is adjustable for windage I really like the traditional military sights uh, although the sight picture isn't fantastic now given the age and purpose of the gun it doesn't have the facility to mount a scope um, which would seem alien for a modern air gun but this is from a time when scopes weren't common even in the military now looking at the markings of the gun uh, I've done as much research as I can about the different markings but there isn't an awful lot of information about these rifles in my reference books so I've had to rely largely on the internet now like many military guns the markings can vary greatly from gun to gun uh, depending on a number of factors and you'll notice that this gun does not actually say Cheska Zabrovka uh, anywhere on it. Instead, it has the logo and name of Zabrovka Berno, uh, which is a separate um, firearms manufacturer, and were at the time the biggest and most well-known weapons maker in Czechoslovakia. And the reason for that relates to this marking underneath, Narodny Podnik. Now that tra uh, translates as national enterprise and the way I understand it from the research I've done is that during this period all firearms manufacture in Czechoslovakia was controlled by a central state-run agency under which Cheska Zabrovka and Zabrovka Brno shared a lot of production. So in this case, although the gun was designed by Cheska Zabrovka, a considerable number of them were actually manufactured by Zabrovka Brno. Most of the Zabrovka Berno ones carried their name and logo, as you can see here, and most of the uh, Cheska Zabrovka guns manufactured at their plant in Strakonis carried their name and the rampant lion from the Czechoslovakian coat of arms, although I have seen uh, examples with combinations of the two, as well as guns with very few markings. Here we have the model number, VZ47, and a serial number. This one is 29,125. Now I believe there were between 50,000 and 65,000 of these rifles produced, so this one is about halfway through production. Uh, for me personally though, the most interesting marking on this whole gun is this very small crossed swords, and that's because it's an extremely rare mark to find on their gun, as that is actually a military marking. Uh, the crossed swords being the acceptance mark, um, or the property mark of the Czechoslovakian military. And the last marking on this gun is a small HK in a circle there, which is also found on the back of the bolt. Um, I'm not 100% sure um, what that relates to, I haven't been able to find out. Um, from what I've read, it appears to be a Zabrovka Berno mark, as I've seen references to it being found on other guns of theirs, but apart from that I'm none the wiser. So if anyone has any information about what that means, please leave a comment below, as I'd love to find out. Just cutting in quickly once more, uh, in the time between making this video and uploading it, I've actually found out what that HK marking is. Now, despite it being found on a number of Zabrovka Berno guns, it actually has nothing to do with them. That HK is the marking of Heinrich Krieghoff, which was a completely separate German firearms manufacturer, which clearly seems a bit of an oddity. Now, I know that in pre-war occupied Czechoslovakia, the Germans sent some Czech-made guns to Heinrich Krieghoff for assembly and proofing, uh, but that obviously doesn't fit the story here, as this is a post-war gun. Um, after the war, though, the Heinrich Krieghoff plant in Ulm in Germany was captured by the Russians, and all of the tooling and everything was taken back to the Soviet Union. So I assume Heinrich Krieghoff's connection to this gun is to do with that, but I'm not entirely sure of the exact circumstances of it. Now the one other marking of note to mention when talking about the VZ-47, um, although it's not found on my rifle here, is there are a number of these guns stamped with the words Narodny, uh, I think it's pronounced Bezpeknost, 
which means National Police or National Security. Now I'm not sure whether these rifles were manufactured specifically for the security forces or whether they were passed on to them once the army had finished with them. I'm now going to test the accuracy of the rifle. I'm going to fire 10 shots at one of these 14 centimetre square targets at a distance of around 12 metres and I'll be using those Grief Puntkugel uh, lead balls that I showed you earlier on uh, and I'm going to be loading them one at a time to avoid any double feeds. Here I have my target. Now there are actually only nine shots on it, uh, but the other one would have hit the target, but it hit the bit of metal which holds the target in place, uh, which you can see in the regular speed footage, but I'm not sure if it was visible when sped up. Now the accuracy clearly isn't great. Um, lead balls are not as accurate as Diablo pellets, especially in, as the ones I'm using are slightly undersized, so they aren't as tight a fit in the barrel um, as they ideally should be. Now the CZ number nine lead balls are very slightly more accurate, uh, but they're not as consistent or reliable. Now it doesn't entirely excuse the accuracy, but I'll come back to that in just a second once I've tested the power. Here I have my chronograph test sheet. Now using those 7.65 grain Grief Punkgegeln lead balls, I got an average velocity of 449.07 feet per second, with a very reasonable spread of only 10.3 feet per second, the highest being 453.1 feet per second, and the lowest being 443.1 feet per second. And using that average of 449.07 feet per second, that gives me a relatively low power of 3.43 pounds. Now for the record I did already know the power of this rifle but it wouldn't have mattered if it had come out at one foot pound or twelve foot pounds as it's almost irrelevant really as is the accuracy. Not only is this gun around 70 years old uh, it was designed for general marksmanship and getting recruits used to the look and feel of a full-size military rifle. Uh, it was never really designed to have the accuracy of a competition rifle or the power of a hunting rifle because it simply wasn't required for its purpose. So there you've seen the CZ VZ-47 military training air rifle. Now I'm really interested in military history, especially historic small arms, uh, in particular the old woodstock bolt action rifles such as the Car 98 and the Mosin Nagant. Uh, in fact I used to own a deactivated World War II era Car 98 and it's because of that interest that I'd been on the lookout for a military training air rifle for a while and there were a number on my radar including the VZ-47. I just think it's fascinating to research all the military markings and to, who, uh, to think who would have used this rifle when it was first issued 70 odd years ago. Now I love modern sporting air guns but for me they're not half as interesting as the old military trainers. Now I don't know how many VZ-47s there are in the UK, as far as I'm aware the majority of the ones still in existence are still in mainland Europe, uh, particularly in the Czech Republic and Germany, uh, but I think there are a fair few in the USA as well. This one came up at a vintage firearms auction a year or two ago uh, with a guide price of 150 to 250 pounds and as you don't see them that often I put in a bid and won it for 220 pounds which with fees cost me a total of 286 pounds and I think that's a very reasonable price as that's actually the cheapest I've ever seen one go for. Uh, they're usually advertised for around 350 to 400 pounds uh, but I have seen them a lot more expensive than that for both dealers and private sellers uh, the most expensive one I've ever seen for sale was advertised at well over £700. Now, I'm really glad I did buy the gun as it's now one of my favourite rifles. Uh, I know it's not massively accurate or powerful and it's a bit of a pain to find ammunition for it but it is a really cool gun. Now I don't shoot this one uh, half as often as a lot of my other guns as this is a bit of a collector's item but I have had it serviced, it is in shooting condition so I do still get it out and use it from time to time 
as as much as I like collecting guns I don't think I could ever have a gun in my collection that I didn't get out and use every now and again. Now if you found this video interesting I do actually have another military training air rifle which I will be making a video on and um, putting that up at some point or another so keep your eyes out for that. Uh, be sure to like, comment and subscribe to the Air Armoury and until next time keep your arms in the air.